Welcome to the webinar, Creating Happy Internet of Things Customers, with Pilgrim Beard from Device Pilot and Adam Byrne from Real VNC. We're going to introduce ourselves in a moment, and then I'll give you a few thoughts from a Device Pilot perspective, and then Adam will give us some thoughts from a Real VNC perspective. We'll finish off with some conclusions, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, and there's also a poll. So if you look to the side of your live stream um, client, you'll see um, a place where you can type your questions. Please type your questions at any point as we speak so that we can uh, quickly answer them when we get to that part of the uh, webinar. And also, please do vote in the polls. And then at the end, we'll give you a few resources for further reading. So to introduce ourselves, I'm Pilgrim Beer, CEO of Device Pilot. I've started several connected product companies. My previous startup was Alert Me, where we built uh, what became Hive from British Gas. It was the UK's first successful smart home platform. And we went from vision to eventually deploying millions of connected devices in homes in the UK and the US. We obviously learned a lot from that journey. The biggest lesson we learned was the difficulty of managing connected devices once you get to scale. Uh, and that's really what led to the creation of Device Pilot. Device Pilot is a SaaS, a cloud service, which allows companies with connected products to easily manage their connected devices. So my name is Adam Byrne. I'm COO here at Real VNC. Uh, I have an academic background in mathematics and computer science, but have used that to grow and run various IT businesses. I'm now with Real VNC, uh, who were the pioneers really of screen sharing back in the late 90s, um, originally an open source project where we gained quite a lot of brand love for Real VNC, um, but later commercialized in 2002 um, and went on a, a journey through perpetual software sales, through to SaaS, now doing OEM licensing deals to build remote access into hardware and software um, platforms for, for other vendors. Uh, so that's me. Thanks, Adam. So we're talking about customer happiness and the Internet of Things. Does it, does it really matter? Well, I think it does a lot. And I think the primary reason for that is that the Internet of Things is very disruptive. Over the next 15 years, we're going to see a degree of disruption to everyday life that's probably similar to the one that the web has, has given us over the last 15 years. And we're already starting to see that in our daily lives. So that will introduce new business models and changes in the, in the value chains. And it will also mean a lot of displacing of incumbent providers. So to give a concrete example of that, um, if we consider the relationship between an ordinary end consumer and the utility company that delivers their uh, water and electricity and gas, in the olden days, that was a very simple one-to-one -one relationship. But now along comes players like uh, Nest uh, and like uh, PodPoint, the electric vehicle charging uh, solution. They're delivering very exciting, engaging propositions directly to end consumers. And of course, that puts them in a position to really understand those consumers probably much better than the utility did. They can see a lot about those consumers' lives. They can see how they consume energy. That puts them even in a position to be able to recommend uh, which utility you should choose if you live in a country where you have a choice or which tariff you should be on. And that's obviously a very powerful position to be in. But it only works if you succeed in really getting that face time with the end user, really getting mind share with the end user. And you can only do that if you really delight them. So these disruptive IoT models do rely on really making your customer happy. And of course, in the modern age, any digital company, which certainly includes all IoT company, really relies on brand as a measure of quality uh, and on referrals from existing customers, um, which can be in a sort of one-to-one -one fashion via net promoter score, which I'll talk in a moment, um, or uh, virally and, and more broadly on social media. And finally, when we look at the value of companies today, it's increasingly recognized that digital companies are valued not just on the basis of their uh, revenue and cash flow and so on, but also on a number of intangibles, which can include things like in intellectual property, but it also very much includes goodwill. And I think probably the, the most extreme example of this I can think of is Apple, who have managed to develop a, an enormous fan base who will basically buy anything Apple make. Uh, and and that, that goodwill is hard to win and easy to lose. Um, and it's very important to develop. So if we care about whether our customers are happy, how can we find out? Well, we could go and ask them, but obviously that's expensive and time consuming. So are there any remote indicators of happiness that we can use, uh, perhaps a bit more scalably? Uh, and one very good one is whether they pay the bill. 
Uh, another one we can use is to measure the inbound inquiries into our customer support line, complaints uh, and questions. Uh, and we can also have a look at uh, public information like Twitter to see if people are complaining or raving about our, our service. The problem with all of these approaches really is that first of all, they have a lot of lag in them. If your customer pays you, for example, an annual bill, you'll only discover that they're no longer your customer in perhaps a year's time, which is too late to do anything about it. They also suffer from poor coverage. So there may be many people who are dissatisfied and vow never to use your thing again, but you just don't know about it because they don't tell anyone and they don't shout about it. So how can we do better than this? And I think the important point here is that with the Internet of Things, your product is not only connected for a functional reason, for example, remote control or whatever, but we can actually use that connection to answer this question about whether customers are happy. And it's, this is a really profound change. A really good analogy here, I think, is uh, with, with the web. So when you develop a website, um, you do your best to build a really good website, but the only way you know if it's any good is to measure that. And you might use a, a tool like Google Analytics to let you see in aggregate what the experience of all your website customers is. How many visitors have you got? Are they converting? Are they bouncing? Which bits of the site are they using? You absolutely have to have a tool like that to let you understand the customer experience in order to make sure it's a good one. Well, it's exactly the same now with products. When you connect your product, it's exactly like a website. You can see how many people are using it. You can see how they're using it and, and what kind of problems they're having. And you can use that to make sure that they're happy customers. You can do that in aggregate for your entire customer experience, or you can actually follow the journey of individual customers. So for example, if they get into trouble, you can look back and see exactly why. So we can use that connection to collect data from our devices, which can in some way allow us to infer the happiness of each customer. So let's have a think about what those metrics might be, what that data we could collect is. And the most fundamental thing, obviously, for a connected product is, is it connected? Um, it may not be for one of a variety of reasons. And presumably, that connectedness is part of your value proposition to your customers. So presumably, if it's not connected, your customers are not happy. So it's very important to measure what availability of, of connection you're actually delivering. Is it 90%, 99%, or whatever? If it's connected, then the next question is, is it actually working? And this really can be asked at two levels. The first one is, is a technical level. The product itself may know whether it's working or not. But the other level is uh, at a higher user level. So, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. You can also, of course, measure the in interactions between the user and the product. So for example, um, button presses and so on. So how do we turn these metrics into, into a measure of happiness? Well, we're trying to think about a good user experience. So one thing we can look for is errors. Obviously, if the device is throwing application errors, then it knows it's not delivering what it should be doing. But there are lots of other cases where there are problems, but they're not that obvious. So one is repeats. Imagine you've got a connected thermostat and there's a button on it which um, allows the user to say, I'm too cold, please warm up my house. If they're repeatedly pressing that button, then obviously something's wrong, that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be doing that. We can look for hotspots in the user experience, things that we don't expect people to be spending much time doing. We can also think about unavailability. So an example of that would be, imagine you're a company selling um, electric vehicle charging points and you've got eight of them installed in a shopping center. And you know that all eight of them are working perfectly, uh, but all eight of them are being used. So what happens when the ninth customer comes along? Technically, everything's working, but the customer isn't buying electric vehicle charging points, they're buying the ability to charge their car and suddenly there is no availability. So that kind of high level yeah, customer satisfaction is what we're really trying to measure. Now, eventually you will unfortunately lose some of your customers and they will churn as it's called in the trade. And as that happens, you will sometimes be able to deduce um, ways in which with hindsight, you could actually predict that churn. So often um, reducing their utilization of the product is a, is a classic indicator, but there may be other ones and you can, you can build a model that will help you predict churn. So the really big thing to think about in all of this is what is the user journey? So from cradle to grave, through your device lifecycle, the user is going to have certain experiences and you need to make sure they're good ones. So does any of this really make a difference? Well, I've got one piece of evidence that it does. 
So at my previous company, Alert Me, we built this, this smart home platform. Um, and after we deployed the first 8,000 um, end customers, our channel partner, British Gas, went out and it actually measured what's called the net promoter score. So they went and asked every customer, would you recommend us to a friend? And the people who do are promoters. The people who say no way are detractors. You subtract one from the other, and you get a score between minus 100% and plus 100%. And the amazing result of that is that those 8,000 people increase their net promoter score by plus 50 percentage points because of the IoT proposition. So this is hard evidence that this stuff really can make a difference to people's happiness. So finally, I just wanted to leave you with the thought that really what we're trying to do in going from metrics into happiness is do three things, really. The first is to get visibility into what those metrics are. The second thing is to then define what good looks like, and we can call that monitoring. And that also helps us understand for the customers that are not happy, why, and that's where analysis comes in. So before I hand over to Adam, I'd just like to remind you, please do vote on the poll, and please do ask us any questions you have. Over to you, Adam. Great, thanks, Pilgrim. Um, I, I want to go on to talk about some case studies where industry verticals are, are using IoT and smart connectivity to improve customer happiness. Um, just quickly, though, I want to recap on the definition of IT of IoT because by my definition, we've actually had this for a long time. But the recent focus on smart connected devices um, has led to more consumer awareness, driving businesses to question how connectivity can best be leveraged for end user happiness. So in the consumer space, we have connected home products like Hive, which Pilgrim has already spoken about. Um, these are now more aware of their owner's movements and can therefore react appropriately. Also security products like Nest cameras that stream live video to the cloud and use machine learning to alert you more intelligently to, pot to potential intruders or changes of environment. Uh, we've also seen an explosion of personal health devices giving fitness more feedback and making it more fun. Numerous consumer electronic devices like washing machines, fridges, ovens, set-top boxes are now connected, allowing you to control your home devices from anywhere. So for example, preheating the oven on your way home from work is very useful if you're extremely hungry. So all in all, the theme is about bringing the customer and the customer's context closer to their remote devices and providing significant and obvious benefit and therefore delight and happiness by doing so. But it's not just about consumers. Um, businesses also benefit from this connected world. So businesses can save many billions of dollars by performing maintenance remotely on their own IT estate or even, or, or even customer products. Everything from MRI scanners in hospitals to ATM machines on the high street. Predictive maintenance is becoming pervasive as well. So for example, washing machines that identify to their manufacturer of an upcoming failure ahead of time, allowing them to schedule and engineer and reduce customer wait times. So these are different audiences, consumer and business, but real realistically at the end of every device, whether you're a buyer or a vendor, there is a customer. So regardless of where this is targeted and creating happy customers means surprising them and delighting them, exceeding their expectations and usually expectations that have been set by a previous less enlightened digital generation. So I just want to talk about these case studies now where particularly we've helped businesses to make customers even happier through smart connectivity. So more or less everybody has a set top box in their house serving satellite, cable or IPTV to their living rooms and such a plethora of devices causes a support challenge. We've all been peeved waiting for engineers to arrive to fault find and fix. One of the biggest cable companies in North America experienced a very public customer satisfaction issue when a recording of a call to their call center went viral. They were struggling to keep their customers happy um, and Customers really perceived that instead of delighting them, they were being kept waiting and wondering. So it, it became a PR problem as well as a customer service problem. And, the, and, and this company assembled a team to find innovative solutions to improving the customer's perception of their service. These boxes were already delivering metrics and telemetry back to the call center. But the problem was that the engineers on the line couldn't see the problem for themselves and certainly couldn't intervene to provide a remedy. They put remote access on their set-top boxes and allowed call centers to control them remotely and securely to diagnose problems, train the customer on how to use them, and even upsell them to additional services. 
delivering multi-million dollar ROI in reduced truck rolls, improved first call resolution, and reduced repeat call rate. It gave them a PR antidote as they created a brand for their remote help solution. So a success for the business and a success for their consumers. Similarly, the financial services industry suffers from not leveraging connectivity to create customer happiness. Now, this is all changing in the 50th anniversary year of the ATM as we transition to smart ATMs. Banks are reducing the number of staff in branches and replacing them with these so-called smart ATMs. This creates a customer care issue, again, for, the, for example, for the older generation who aren't familiar with the technology and become quickly frustrated. So connectivity on ATMs allows a roaming customer care agent on site or even in a call center via on-device video chat to provide assistance in an engaging way, including using screen annotations to direct the user rather than just doing it for them. This way they learn, feel more empowered, and ultimately are less of a support burden for the vendor going forwards. Additionally, due to some conservatism in the financial services industry, many of these devices are running end-of-life operating systems so here we leverage this connectivity to come to the rescue, enabling remotely managed OS upgrades, improving security, and reducing maintenance costs for vendors. Additionally, additionally, remote APIs can be queried to check cash levels and perform fault diagnosis, again, reducing downtime and ensuring customers can, can continue to be served as quickly as possible. Happy customers, happy vendor. And final case study example is the healthcare industry where we have expensive equipment that patients rely, on, rely upon to facilitate diagnosis, treatment, and ultimately improve patient outcomes. If an, if an MRI scanner goes down, appointments are canceled, diagnosis is delayed, and hence so is treatment. And where problems are time critical, this is a disaster. Companies like Philips, Siemens, and GE Healthcare are all using remote connectivity to maximize uptime just like in the other spaces I've been talking about. The companies themselves save money on maintenance, sure, but there is another benefit that can delight patients and doctors. The same technology can be used to share digital imaging from the device with medical consultants who may be elsewhere in the world. So this remote connectivity is bringing expertise to the patient that previously they would not have been able to benefit from, or perhaps would have to travel or rebook an appointment for a later date. All in all, everyone wins. So it's not an accident that connectivity is pervasive. It's now expected because customers have begun to understand what it delivers because of industry leaders, like in the case studies I've mentioned. If you're a device manufacturer, there is so much you can do to measure customer happiness and indeed create it in the world of IoT. Customers will see that your brand is innovating. They will have their problems resolved faster and always feel like help is at hand when they don't understand something. As a device vendor, you'll enjoy a better perception of your brand in the eyes of your customers, save money through quicker support call resolution, and maintain an ecosystem of generally happier partners. Thanks, Adam. And just to recap what I said, I think it's clear that customer happiness is top priority in the Internet of Things, and that the Internet of Things can answer its own question there by helping you to measure and improve that happiness, and that there are now tools that exist which can help you to do that. So we're now going to move on to um, the Q&A part of things. Uh, and I'm just going to have a look and see what questions have come in. Uh, great, we've got some questions. Um, the first one is from Richard Machen saying, are IoT customers happy because they find utility, usefulness, or emotional joy in a great solution? That's a great question. That's something I find myself asking myself a lot when I, when I use product, products in our everyday life don't seem as well designed as, as you would hope. Um, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> Have you got any thoughts on that, Adam? Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a very difficult one. I think, well, I can only really speak personally of the, the devices I use. I'm, I'm a great proponent of smart home. And I think actually um, the, the delight for me comes from that emotional engagement with products. And actually, it, it's more that I feel like I'm making the most of my smartphone because actually just using it for email, it's an incredibly expensive email device. And having IoT devices that now have applications on my smartphone mean that I feel like that investment is somehow better justified because I can access my CCTV at home. I can, my door unlocks remotely when I drive up on the driveway and all, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's just cool and ultimately, um, 
it gives me bragging rights, I guess. <laughs> people think it's cool. People come to my house and enjoy it as well. So um, yeah, being being quite honest, I think it feels good to be at that sort of cutting edge. Good, great. Uh, and actually, just speaking from my own perspective, I mean, certainly at Alert Me, my previous company, a big metric for us was whether people showed this stuff to their mates down, down the pub, <laughs> basically. So it's that bragging rights thing. Um, I think also, um, it, one interesting thing we, we noticed is that uh, if a customer has a problem, but you resolve it really well, they can often end up being a much happier customer than if they'd never had a problem at all, because they've seen um, how, how good you are at, at serving them, and it brings them joy. So that's another thought I have there. And we, I've got many, many case studies where you know that, that demonstrate that. So now a question from Shweta Toma to Adam. Have you done any pilot implementation in India, and can you share the use case? Um, that's that's a good question. Um, it's it's hard for me to share specific customer names at this point, but I think probably the the best example of a of a case study in India would be a, a large managed service provider, um, who in this case are are really connecting to um, more traditional IT devices. So whether we call these IoT devices, I don't know, but really managing IT estates for in, in an outsourced manner for um, for enterprises across the world. So um, I'd, I'd be happy to talk offline in a bit more detail if, uh, if if you want some specifics. But really, I think the the managed service provider one is is the key there. Great. So I'm just looking to see if we've got any poll results yet. We do have some. If you haven't voted yet, then please do so because now is your chance. Um, okay. Going back to the questions, we have one from John Davies. Um, maybe IoT has the potential to disrupt the customer service model by monitoring customers' connected things to create a fully automated customer experience. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I mean, certainly when it comes to things like white goods, um, I think we can all imagine models where, and there's a general trend in the world from moving from selling things as a product with a one-off sale to selling things as a service. And I think that will probably feed through all sorts of things. You know, the millennial generation don't aspire to own things so much. Uh, they, they, they might rent a car when they need one rather than buying one. And the same might be true even of white goods. You know, I'd really like a you know, a washing machine or an oven that just goes on working. And if it stops working, someone else fixes it. And of course, with IoT, that vendor that's providing that ongoing service could monitor that device remotely and, um, uh, you know, predict failure and come and replace it before it fails and, and so on, which could lead to a really great experience for me as a customer, but also a very efficient experience from their perspective because they don't have to go around servicing things that don't need servicing. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And I think one of the great beauties, particularly in the co co consumer electronics space, is that we're seeing um, we're seeing technology in the home get the kind of connectivity and the kind of features that perhaps things like industry has had for a while. So being able to predict failures on manufacturing lines before they happen has been very, very important in order to, to make sure that production cycles are met. Um, that that now is becoming cheaper and cheaper to do. And, and that's why we see things like predictive maintenance technology going into things like washing machines and fridges and all these kind of things. And I, I, I think the democratization of, um, of, of these, these quite sophisticated features will disrupt customer service, absolutely. Great, okay, I think that's it for questions. Um, let's have a look at how we're doing on our polls. So um, I'm actually not sure if you as, as viewers can see the results of these yet, but uh, and we'll send this information to you afterwards. But the first question is, would the ability to remotely connect and take control of some IoT devices be useful to you? And if so, which of the following would you be interested in? And there's a range of options there. But the winner, by a fairly clear margin, is monitoring the activity of, or the health of a device, um, followed by remotely controlling the device's main functions, followed by performing maintenance and upgrades remotely. Um, Let's have a look at the next question, which is, OK, this is just getting a sense in the amongst the webinar audience of how many devices you've deployed so far. And the majority have deployed uh, less than 500 devices. Um, and then there's a, a certain number that have deployed more than 1,000. And the final question was, what stage are you at in your IoT project? And here we've got about 2 thirds of people who are pre-launch, which I guess matches those numbers we just saw, and about 1 third are post-launch. So we're really gratified to see uh, so many attendees to this webinar. It's been great fun talking about this stuff, and it's great to hear so many people excited about delivering a fantastic experience to their customers. For further reading, please see the white papers that are on each of our websites. And of course, you're very welcome to try our products uh, for free as well. 
Thank you very much indeed for listening to this webinar and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.